That's a good crew, isn't it? All right. And everybody else who's here, uh, you can find a Bible and turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be there this morning. As we've been moving through Revelation, um, it's starting to come together a little bit for, for some of us who have been here. I, I, for those of you who are here for the first time this Sunday, uh, I apologize because uh, we've been working through this for several weeks now, and I wish I could just kind of open your brain up and pour in everything we've learned so far, and it's hard to do that, uh, but I would encourage you if you uh, are here and you miss a week or two, maybe to go online. If you look in your bulletins, there's an article in the bulletin called Keeping Up, and there's a URL there, just fbcmuncie.org slash keep up, and if you go to that URL or bookmark that, You'll have everything that you need to kind of uh, catch up on Sundays that you've missed. But I do want to do my best to pull everybody up to speed this morning because we're in the book of Revelation. It's a book that's challenging, as many of you would know, and it's difficult. It's one that many times we just kind of avoid as Christians. It's just sitting there at the end, and it's got all this weird stuff in it, and so we don't really read it. And if we do read it, uh, we don't really know what it, under, what, what it means. We don't understand it. So uh, this morning, we are working through, and we are, we are going to be in Revelation for quite some time as we walk through uh, this chapter by chapter. And I want to do my best uh, to pull everybody up to speed this morning. So let's, let's talk about what we've learned so far. Revelation is strange and weird because it is in a genre that we don't often read. A genre called apocalyptic genre, or it is an apocalyptic letter. And we read that word apocalyptic and we think in our day and time that English word um, means end times, doom, right? You see movies about the apocalypse and you think of the world kind of burning up or falling to pieces, right? That's what we think about. But the word apocalypse it doesn't mean that at all. The word apocalypse means to lift a veil off. And so it's peeking into a dimension or a reality that is quite different from what we see here. And as we've talked about over the last few weeks, the churches in Asia Minor, the ones who are receiving this letter, are struggling because they're living in the midst of the first century Roman Empire. And it was not a world where a Christian could easily live because everything that was going on around them, the pagan temple worship, the imperial worship where people actually worshiped the emperor. There were festivals in town, right, that would worship Caesar and say things like, Caesar is Lord. And if you're a Christian, that just doesn't quite fit. And so the Christians are struggling. Many are being persecuted. Others are, are kind of falling into just the cultural patterns. And, and so John writes this letter. Again, we talked about the fact that he is exiled on this island of Patmos. He is on this kind of prison island. And he has this vision. And in this vision, Jesus is laying out for him this apocalypse or this apocalyptic letter. Again, not necessarily an end times letter, although it does talk about the way things are going to end, but really it is more about peeking into another dimension. And so that's why things look so strange. That's why it's weird. But again, if you read other apocalyptic letters or other apocalyptic writings, you would know that symbols are really a part of how it works out. And so we're going to work through this today. It's not going to be as strange as it's going to be in the coming weeks. I'll warn you, uh, next week is going to be really cool, by the way. I can't wait to talk about Revelation chapter 4 where John steps into the throne room and what he sees. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, so I won't, won't do that. But today we're going to be looking at these three letters. And when last week we covered the first four letters, how many churches are there? Seven. And we talked about the fact last week that seven, uh, there were seven real literal churches, but seven is also the number that is the complete number. And so these, these letters to seven churches also clue us into the fact that they're really the complete letter to all churches in all times. And so really as we read these letters, they're for us also. But we are going to look at the particular context of these latter three churches this morning. And we're going to talk about how um, Jesus' words to them might apply to us. Now, 
I want to just go over this pattern with you for just a moment here because in every single letter here, there is a pattern. First of all, Jesus is described in some particular way. And so we'll read Jesus' description here. And then we will talk about something good that is happening in each church. You'll see that. Now, one church, Laodicea, which we're going to cover today, has nothing good said of them. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Wouldn't you hate to be that church, right? Nothing good. Isn't there anything? Nope, nothing. And then there is something kind of negative said of each church, or kind of a criticism, a failing, if you will. And the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia have nothing bad said of them. So they're um, kind of lifted up a little bit there. And then after that, you see some sort of warning or promise in the letter. And then this kind of call to hear Jesus, to open your ears to what he's saying is in each letter. So there's a pattern that goes through each here, each, each letter. And again, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation are probably the most familiar chapters of this book. If you've heard sermons on Revelation, you've probably heard sermons from these chapters. And many times, pastors will, will actually preach these chapters in seven different sermons, a, a sermon on each church. And so, for us to cover four last week and three this week, we're moving really, really fast. And there's a lot here that we won't have time to cover. And so let me just warn you ahead of time. If you got a question, feel free to email me or catch me after the service and say, what does that mean? Or how does this um, play out? Or, and so we, we just don't have a time to get into it as deeply as I would like. And, and I'm doing this because I want to move on to the rest of a letter. And I don't think you want to be in Revelation for three years, do you? So we're going to have to move pretty quick. So this morning we're going to be looking um, at these letters. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to read the letter from a different translation than you probably have in front of you. The translation that you have in front of you, if you have a pew Bible, is the NIV translation. And again, translations are are really that the Bible, the New Testament, was written in Greek. So anything that we have in English is a translation of that Greek. And that's why you see different translations. And the NIV is what is, is in the pew Bible. But one particular translation that's fairly new is a translation called New Testament for Everyone. And it's by a guy, a British guy named N.T. Wright. And I love the way the words flow in this, in this letter, or in this translation. So I'm going to read the letter, and I'm going to ask you not even to look at your Bibles. Just maybe even close your eyes if you want to. And just listen to this letter. Listen to how it flows. And then we're going to talk about it, and then we'll go to the second letter, and then we'll go to the third letter. So first of all, we're going to read the letter to the church at Sardis. Listen to these words. Write this to the angel of the church in Sardis. These are the words of the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know what you have done. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen the things that remain. The things that are about to die. Because I haven't found your works to be complete in my sight or in the sight of my God. So remember how you received the message, how you heard it and kept it, and repent. So if you don't keep awake, I will come like a thief. And you won't know what time I'm coming to you. You do, however... Have a few people in Sardis who haven't allowed their clothes to become dirty and polluted. They will be clothed in white and will walk with me as they deserve. Anyone who conquers will be clothed like this in white robes. And I won't blot their names out of the book of life. I will acknowledge their name in the presence of my Father and in the presence of his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To a letter, the letter at, uh, to the church at Sardis. It begins a lot like the letter to the church at Ephesus, doesn't it? Jesus says, I'm, I'm, I'm holding these seven spirits or these seven stars. And in other words, uh, these are the ones who has the seven spirits and the seven stars. And so we get this idea of Jesus kind of being there and having the church in his hands. But we read here, there's something negative said of Sardis. Now, one dynamic that we might not know of Sardis is that Sardis sits atop 
a hill. And scholars tell us that many thought that Sardis was impenetrable by, by opposing forces. Now, 600 years before this letter was written, Sardis was attacked. A guy named Cyrus, the Persian, went in and took Sardis. And, and so there was kind of a reputation that nobody could defeat this city. But then there's this dynamic that someone did defeat it. And so Jesus is kind of playing on this dynamic, I think, in the letter here. Because Sardis has a reputation. In military, uh, its military reputation is that it was impenetrable. Its spiritual reputation was that it was doing well. Things were going well. The church was alive. But Jesus says that the reputation is not accurate. The reputation is not true. Jesus says you need to wake up. Now, they're not sleeping literally. That imagery of sleeping and waking up is a spiritual sort of dynamic. And they, they are sleeping spiritually, not literally. They're not awake to what God is doing. They're kind of living on this reputation. You, you know, I think there are many Christians like that in our world today, right? People know you. You go to church. People see that you are a follower of Jesus. And, and uh, maybe you put on Facebook, you know, I was in church this Sunday and everybody sees that. And they think, man, that's really a good person right there, right? And they think you've got it all together. They think that... You know, you're living as God wants you to live, but deep down inside, there's something going on that nobody else sees. It's not posted on social media. It's not even something that your friends and family know about, but it's there, and it's a dark place. And the works for Jesus that you're doing, they're not complete, as it says of the church in Sardis. And Jesus' words to that church are, wake up. The words to that church are, you think that you have it all together, but you don't. And then he uses this imagery here. He says, there are a few people who have not allowed their clothes to become dirty or polluted. Now again, he's not talking about literal clothes here, is he? What, what do we know of white clothes in Revelation? What do we see? We see people wearing white clothes. And, and next week you're going to see this whole imagery of people wearing white robes. What's this all about? You might think, well, maybe they're going to get baptized because we wear white robes when we get baptized, right? Well, there, there's symbolism there. The white robes have to do with purity. And again, it's not talking about literal clothes here. It's talking about a garment that will cover our nakedness, right? Our spiritual kind of lack of forgiveness, the, the white robes mean purity, they mean cleansing. And so Jesus says there are some in Sardis who are wearing white robes. And then he says, anyone who conquers, anyone who sticks with it, will be clothed in white robes. And I will not blot out their name from the book of life. Again, this imagery here, we get this imagery in Revelation of God having a book, right? And names that are written in this book, this book of life, that will one day be the ones who are redeemed. And so we get this image here of white robes and a book of life. And Jesus says, look, you need to wake up. You need to quit resting on your reputation. I think even as a church, we have a reputation, don't we? You think about this church has been here for 160 years. That's a long time, isn't it? And there are lots of good things that this church has done. And many generations who have been faithful throughout the life of this church. But we can't rest on that, can we? We can't simply say, well, you know, our church has done some great things in the past. We, we have a new generation. And each and every generation has to wake up to what God is doing and then join him in that. The letter to the church at Sardis. Let's keep going this morning. There's a lot here we could cover, but I want to keep moving on to the next letter. The next letter is to the church in Philadelphia. And this is not Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a different Philadelphia. And we read here in this letter. Write this to the angel of a church in Philadelphia. These are the words of the Holy One, the true one. The one who has the key of David. Who opens, who, who opens and nobody shuts and who shuts and nobody opens. I know 
your works. Look, I have given you an open door right in front of you and nobody can shut it. Still, you have a little power. You have kept my word and you haven't denied my name. Look, this is what I will do to the Satan synagogue who call themselves Jews, but who are frauds. Nothing of the kind. Take note of this. Take note. This is what I will grant you. That I will make them come and worship before your feet. And they will know that I have loved you. You have kept my word about patience. And so I will keep you from the time of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test all, out all the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that nobody takes away your crown. Anyone who conquers, I will make them a pillar in the temple of my God. They will never go out of it again. I will write on that person the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my own new name. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Man, there's so much here. <laughs> I mean, again, we can spend a whole sermon on this, but I do want to just highlight a few things that are going on here. What's going on in Philadelphia? There's a group in Philadelphia of Jews who have claimed that Jesus is not the Messiah. They've said, you know what, Jesus is a false Messiah. And so we see this, this message here at the very beginning in verse 7 here. These are the ones of the, the words of the Holy One. Who's the Holy One? Jesus is the Holy One. And how is he described here? He's the one who has the key of David. What's all that about? What's a key? Again, we've talked about that imagery of a key. A key is what unlocks something, isn't it? A key is what you have. If you're going to drive a car, you have a key or maybe a fob in today's world, right? If you're going to enter a house, you have a key or at least a code to punch in and get into that house, right? A key, though, gives us access. And this key of David is about Jesus being the Messiah. And as we read a little further here, we see... Jesus addressing this particular group here as a Satan synagogue. What's all that about? Again, this group of Jews who are persecuting the Christians. A group of Jews who are saying, Jesus is not the Messiah. And perhaps some of the Christians have fallen in. Some of the Christians have said, you know, maybe he's not the Messiah. He doesn't seem to be in charge today, so maybe he was a false Messiah. And so that's the dynamic that's happening in Philadelphia. What is said negative of the church? Nothing is said negative of Philadelphia. The church in Philadelphia is strong. But the church in Philadelphia is struggling because of persecution. And so Jesus' words to them are, I'm coming back. That sounds a lot like his parables, doesn't it? We often read Jesus, we, these parables, Jesus would talk about a landowner who's put in charge of a particular portion of land. The master goes away, and then one day he will return. And so you see this language here, the Church of Philadelphia, that, that this Satan synagogue, they're persecuting the Christians. Jesus promises that these particular Jews will one day bow down at the feet of the Christians. Again, he's, he's pointing to the end of time, how things are going to end, if you will. And then he describes to them, hold on, stick with it. If you conquer, he says, I will make you a pillar in the temple. Now, another thing that you might not know about Philadelphia is that it was a place where earthquakes happened often. In fact, there are r records that in Philadelphia that that city was destroyed a number of times from earthquakes. And a pillar makes particular application in a place where there are earthquakes, right? Because what do pillars do? Pillars hold buildings up. And so we got this image in Philadelphia of a church that's being shaken like an earthquake, right? And Jesus says, but to those who hold on, I'm going to make you pillars, you're going to hold the building up. You're going to be in this temple. Again, this imagery here is rich because the imagery is that we're being placed in the temple of God and we're never going to have to leave the temple of God. It's just this layer, layer upon layer of imagery. The church of Philadelphia, struggling with persecution, Jews who are 
uh, persecuting and are saying Jesus is not the Messiah. So all of this language has to do with Jesus being the son of David and those who it will endure, who stick it out, who continue to confess his name, will be strong and will not be shaken by the earthquake. All right, Sardis, Philadelphia, we have one more. And this perhaps is the most famous church. How many of you ever heard a sermon from the church at Laodicea? Have you ever heard of this? Yes. Most of us have if, we've been, if we grew up in church. We've heard at least one sermon. And I think it's one of the most famous churches because uh, it's, it's the church that's, that's criticized the most, right? Jesus' words to Laodicea, you're going to see in just a moment, are, are, are heavy, are harsh. I mean, he comes down on them pretty hard. One of the things I want to point out, though, about Laodicea before we read this, because I want you to hear this letter with, with kind of the context in mind. But the church in Laodicea was also in a region where there were earthquakes. And what would happen in uh, the Roman Empire is that if a town suffered an earthquake, the, the Roman Empire would send tax dollars into that town and would rebuild the town. Not just tax dollars from that city, but really from the whole Roman Empire. And so if an earthquake happened, cities would, would probably you know, say, well, we were destroyed, this was destroyed, this was destroyed, and the Romans would come in and fix it. Well, N.T. Wright describes in his commentary that in A.D. 61, there was an earthquake in Laodicea. So we're talking about maybe 30 years or so before this letter was written. And Laodicea refused tax dollars. They said, you know what? We can handle this. We're going to rebuild the city. We've got enough money. We're rich enough. And they rebuilt their own city without tax dollars from the Roman Empire. That's how rich they were. That's how economically prosperous this town was. And so this town, Laodicea, sits at the crossroads of major trade routes. And so they've got money flowing into the city. Probably more money than they know what to do with. There was also a medical school in Laodicea. And people would travel from all over to study medicine in Laodicea. And we're told that in this medical school, there was a particular salve for eyes. That people would travel from all over and they would come to Laodicea for healing of their eyes. And you're going to see this in just a moment here as we read this letter. Jesus references this here also. We also know in Laodicea that there was a particular breed of black sheep that had high quality wool and this particular wool was the best wool that money could buy. So people would travel from all over the world to Laodicea to buy this black wool. And so it was a prosperous place. Lots of good things happening in Laodicea, at least economically, right? And look at what Jesus says to them. Read with me or listen to these words and then, and then reference them in just a moment. Let Revelation 3 verses 14 through 22 out of the New Testament from e for everyone translation. He says, write this to the angel of the church in Laodicea. These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witnesses. The beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've done well, I don't need anything. But you don't know that you are miserable, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This is the advice for you. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. That'll make you rich. And white clothes to cover yourselves and pre prevent your shameful nakedness or your shameful nakedness being seen. And also healing ointment to put on your eyes. There's that reference to eyes. So that you will be able to see. When my people are my friends, I tell them when they're in the wrong and I'll and I punish them for it. So stir up your spirits and repent. Look, I'm standing here knocking at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and eat with them and they with me. This will be my gift to the one who conquers. I will sit them beside me on my throne just as I conquered and sat 
with my Father on His throne. Let the one who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Wow, what a letter, right? What's said of Laodicea that's good? (laughs) Nothing. What's said of them that's challenging? Now, one of the more famous passages in This letter to the church at Laodicea has to do with this water. And one of the things you might not know about Laodicea is they had lots of money. And it was economically, it was a great place. But they struggled with water. They did not have a good water supply. The river that ran through Laodicea was was a river that would even dry up in certain seasons of the year. So they didn't have a steady flow of water. But just to the north of Laodicea were hot springs. And scholars tell us that these springs were were springs that people would go to uh, for healing. It was kind of like a resort area. In in Georgia, there's a place called Warm Springs. You ever heard of that place? It was a place where Franklin Roosevelt would go, and actually the place where he died. And there were these natural springs that kind of would would, uh, spew up this this chemically charged hot water. And it was good for for bathing, uh, but you couldn't drink it because... It had all of these chemicals in it. So there was this hot water spring north of Laodicea. And they built aqueducts to transport that hot water from that place to Laodicea. It was about a five-mile aqueduct. And what happened was by the time the water got to Laodicea, it was no longer hot. And it was lukewarm. And scholars tell us that it really wasn't good for anything. You couldn't bathe in it because it didn't have all of the the, the heat that it had uh, five miles north. So people would just kind of travel up to the north part and would use the water for that purpose. There was another water source south of Laodicea. And scholars tell us that it was the kind of water that was coming off of a high mountain and would often be snow melt. And it was ice cold water. And so Laodiceans thought, we'll build an aqueduct to that water source. And so they did that. But by the time that the water was moved from that source into Laodicea, it traveled about five miles across the Turkish heat. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it was what? Lukewarm. And so, I don't know if you've heard this misinterpreted. I've heard it this way. I've I've always heard it, you know what? Jesus wants you hot, right, or cold. He wants you on fire for him, or he doesn't want you to care anything about him at all. And that's a misinterpretation of this. And I always thought, why would Jesus not want us to be, why, why would Jesus want us to be cold? Why would he want us to care, not care anything about him? It's not talking about that at all. You see, hot water is good. Cold water is good. Lukewarm water is not good. And so what Jesus is saying, again, if you're in Laodicea, you would have known exactly what he's talking about. He's saying, look, hot water, I want you to be like that water. It's good. Cold water, I want you to be like that water. It's good. But lukewarm water, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because I can't drink it. You see the dynamic there? See how that plays out? Jesus wants us to be in a good place not a lukewarm place. That, that, uh, that passage preaches well, and that's why you hear it. I uh, hear it so often. People, you know, get on fire for God. He doesn't want you to be cold. Uh, he doesn't want you to be lukewarm. He'd rather you just not even care about him, or he, he wants you to be with him. No, it's not at all. Jesus is saying, I want you to be of value to the kingdom. And then Jesus says to them, look, you're rich. You, you think you have it all. But you're not. Look at how he describes him. I mean, it's pretty crazy how he describes him. He say, you say, you say, I'm rich. I've done well. I don't need anything. But you don't know. You're miserable, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In verse 17. That's how he describes him. What is going on in reality does not match what's going on spiritually. And that's what he says to the church there. You know... We all have a tendency, don't we? Those of us who have plenty and those of us who live in America today, no matter where we would fall on the economic spectrum in our town, we are of the richest people in the world. In fact, just the poorest among us would still be in the 99 percentile in terms of world wealth. So we're all rich. And we all have plenty. 
Most of us aren't worrying about where our next meal is coming from. Most of us have a bed to sleep in at night. And we have what we need. And sometimes when we have what we need, we don't turn to God. Sometimes when we have what we need, we, we think we don't need God, right? We don't pay a lot of attention to God. And Jesus says, look, you need to take your resources. And, and, and then he uses this imagery here. And I just want to walk through this with you because it's so powerful. He says, you need to buy gold, but not literal gold. He says, the kind of gold that's refined in the fire. What is that all about? We know that many of the churches in this day and time are suffering persecution. Their spirituality is being refined in the fire. And that's what Jesus is saying of a church at Laodicea. You need to, you need to jump in to the kind of spirituality that's, that's tested and get refined in the fire. You need to buy clothes. Not go to the shopping mall and buy the newest fashion. You need to buy what? What did he say? White robes. Is that what's in in Laodicea? No, it's not, he's not talking about literal clothes, is he? What, what are white robes signify? White robes are purity, aren't they? They, they cover our nakedness completely. And you're going to see this white robe imagery used throughout Revelation over and over again. And every time you see it again, it's not talking about literal white robes. It's talking about spiritual covering, okay? The sin, the nakedness. The white robe is purity, it's forgiveness. And Jesus is able to put on the white robe, to put it on us and to cover our nakedness. And then he talks about eyes. You need eye healing. Maybe you came to Laodicea. Maybe you're here because you had eye problems. And you came to the medical school to get treatment for your eyes. You need to stop worrying about your physical eyes. And you need to start thinking about spiritual eyes. And you need to get the salve that I have, Jesus says, that will open your eyes to spiritual understanding. And then look at Jesus' posture here. Jesus isn't saying to them, as negative as it seems here, he's not saying to them, you're done, you're finished. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm standing here and I'm knocking. And I'm waiting on you to open the door. Repentance is something that you can still do. Trade in what you have physically for what I have spiritually, Jesus says. And then we get this imagery here toward the end of uh, the book there in Laodicea. This imagery of one who conquers. And again, that's imagery that you see over and over again in Revelation. Sticking it out to the end. And what does it mean to conquer? You see, in the Roman Empire, in the, that first century, people were challenged with this over and over again. Who are you going to confess as Lord? Is it going to be Caesar or is it going to be Jesus? And many times when Christians would say, Jesus is Lord, it would, it would be costly for them. And so conquering is sticking it out until the end. Conquering is being faithful to the end. And so that's what Jesus, that's the imagery that Jesus uses here. The one who conquers will sit on my throne. And then he says to them, let the one who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Wow. This is powerful stuff. And again, I could have spent seven weeks on these seven letters because there's so much here. But as we close this morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to challenge you to think for just a moment about these three churches. Again, we covered the last four last week, but let's look at these three. Uh, let's think about Sardis for just a moment. And maybe this morning, uh, reputation is something that you're struggling with. Maybe you have a good reputation, but it's not your real reputation. It's not your real uh, self. You know, we live in a world of social media today where the real self is, is, is not, uh, not often portrayed, you know. We only see the good things of everybody. We see the engagements and the marriages and the vacations. We don't see the divorces and the times when people are really struggling and the inadequacies that people feel that they have. You don't usually post that on social media. Now, some people do, right? But most of the time, it's just the good stuff. And maybe this morning, God would be speaking to you, and God would be saying to you, you're like Sardis. You, you got half-finished stuff going on, and you need to join the team. You need to, to, to finish the work that you've been called to do. Quit relying on the reputation that you have. It doesn't mean anything. 
Maybe this morning you find yourself like the church in Philadelphia. You're just barely holding on. And forces are coming at you from every side. And like the, like the church in Philadelphia, the, the Jews were, were persecuting them and were saying to them, Jesus isn't the Messiah. He really isn't Lord. Caesar is Lord. And everything around you is Lord. And maybe this morning you're struggling in that arena and you, you, you need to hold on this morning and call on Jesus and say, God, would you give me the strength? Maybe you're suffering in some way. And like the church in Philadelphia, Jesus promises to be with you all the way to the end. Maybe this morning you find yourself like the church at Laodicea. You are so concerned with material things. It's overwhelmed you. You feel like you you have it all. But all the while, when it comes to spirituality, there's not much there. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning, you feel the nakedness of your spirituality. And if we were all revealed this morning, you know, we've all got on clothes this morning, right? We're wearing clothes and so our nakedness is covered. What if for just one moment, the only thing that would cover us would be our spirituality? How many of us would be absolutely naked in this place? Think about that. Jesus says you need white robes that will cover you. And one day... The clothes that we're wearing are going to be gone. One day the houses that we live in are going to be gone. One day everything material that we have will be gone. And what will we have? Jesus says to the church at Laodicea, I knock. Come, invite me in. Let me come in and show you what true spirituality is all about. And maybe this morning that's something that you're thinking, that's what I need. I need spirituality. I need to learn how to build that into my life. I need to learn how to go to the feet of Jesus and let him give me all that I need. What powerful letters this morning. And I wonder how God might be speaking to you through these letters. We're going to come to the table in just a moment. Um, And so I'm going to invite the band to come up or whoever's singing to come up. And as we come to the table, uh, it's an opportunity for us to examine ourselves. We're instructed as Christians that when we come to the table, we're to think about all that God is doing in our lives and where we are. We're told that if we um, have some failing in our life and we have a, a, a grievance with a person, we should go and make that right and then come back to the table, is what Paul tells the church in the first century. But he also tells them to examine themselves. And, and, and when I say examine, I don't mean to think about how terrible we are so that we can't come to the table, but to examine ourselves in a way to think, what is going on in my life? Am I open to Jesus? Am I open to to Him moving in my life and doing what He will in me? And then coming to the table and receiving, not because we deserve it, but because He gave for us. His body broken for us. His blood shed for us. If you're at a place this morning where you can confess, His body was broken for me. And I want to receive that. I want to take that in. If you're at a place where you can say, His blood was shed for me. I want to receive that. I want to take that in. You're invited to come and receive this morning the forgiveness of sins. As the elements are brought in now, let's take just a moment to reflect in our hearts what God might be saying to us.